Hello and welcome to Innovation Coffee, brought to you by Arm, where the coffee is hot and the innovation is hotter. My name is Robert Wolf, joined by Michael Hall, here to my hey everyone. right. Hello, hello, hello. And uh, we'll be your host this week and every week as we take a deeper look at the Arm developer ecosystem and explore the many things going on in and around this exciting space. Each of these live streams will start with developer updates, followed by in-depth conversations about Arm and our growing developer ecosystem. Joined by featured Arm experts and partners from within Arm and our developer community, we will discuss a plethora of topics tailored for developers, showcase opportunities, explore resources, and bring new and exciting Arm developments to light. Each of these events will finish off with an audience Q&A. Of course, if you have questions, please feel free to post those in the YouTube chat and we'll do our best to address them as quickly as possible. Now, as a reminder, Mike, what do people do to that like button if they enjoy this stream? They gotta smash that like and subscribe button. They, they annihilate it. Annihilate that like button. Don't forget to also subscribe to the Arm Software Developer YouTube channel uh, because we do content like this all the time, pushing out all sorts of post-production stuff, going to events, live streams like this. Again, every single Thursday at 5 p.m. UTC, we are here. So, uh, Michael, uh, this is a this is this is a good one today. We we have a this we have is, a this is one we've tried to get on in the past and we're not able to. So I'm super super excited that we got him on today. Um, and I've I've just started making my way through his book. Uh, I actually was I started reading that on the plane coming home from Cambridge a couple of weeks ago. So that's some nice airplane reading material right I'm, there. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna, it's gonna be a good show. I'm gonna let you say his name first, the first time for for the, for the stream. Who are we interviewing today? All right, today we're interviewing Jean Marco Iodice, uh, who is the author of the Tiny ML Cookbook. Awesome. No pressure, right? No, no pressure. pressure. No pressure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. The world is watching, uh, John Marco. So, yeah. But no, uh, thank you so much for joining us. It is it's a pleasure to have you here. And, and uh, you know, as you can see, maybe on his name tag, John Marco, you are with Arm, correct? You, you work for Arm. We all work for Arm here. It's a great place to be. Um, I think the first thing we usually do in these streams is the origin story. So we kind of want to get to know you a little bit. Who are you? What do you do? Maybe you can share that, share something with us for a few minutes. More than happy. Uh, but before that, I want to thank you for inviting me today. So it actually is a, a, a great pleasure. Um, but yes, I'm going to talk about uh, about my, my background. So, well, as you said, I work from Arm. Uh, I have been working at Arm for uh, roughly 10 years. Uh, and I joined Arm uh, straight away after uni. Uh, so uni, I graduated in electronic engineering. And guess what? on electronic engineering although to, nowadays i'm working just software but i believe that background actually influenced quite a lot of my uh, activities that i'm doing right now uh, including the uh, the work i'm doing in the tiny ml space uh, and also in ml space because at arm i'm, I'm uh, leading uh, the machine learning development uh, on the uh, at the edge uh, with, I'm tech lead for the ARM Compute Library, uh, which is a software library for machine learning deployed on billions of devices around the world on Android uh, for making machine learning very efficient uh, at the edge. Um, as I said, my background is in electronics and my passion is absolutely about um, making a software very efficient, very performant, but why? Uh, primarily uh, because it's a challenging task. I like challenging tasks, but also because if you make it efficient, you may also make it very, uh, at the same time, power efficient. And for mobile devices, this is a crucial thing. So you want your devices last, hopefully forever, but it's not the case because you have a battery, but uh, as long as possible, I would say. Um, and but apart from the activity and work uh, at Arm, uh, I'm also the, the chair of the Tiny ML Foundation for the Tiny ML Talks. So I'm not sure if you are aware of the Tiny ML Foundation, but the Tiny ML Foundation is uh, is absolutely the place where you you have to be if you don't know anything about Tiny ML. But even if you know something about Tiny ML, you have to to be in the Tiny ML Foundation because. This is the place where the community for Tiny ML is um, uh, sharing, inspiring the next uh, machine learning uh, generation at the very edge. Um, and here, my uh, my goal is about uh, trying to uh, engage the community and, and spread the knowledge of Tiny ML around the world with the Tiny ML talks, which are virtual events like, like this uh, that we usually have uh, on a weekly basis. 
Uh, plus, I'm, as you said, the author of the Tiny Mouse Cookbook. Which so, is the topic of discussion today. That's, that's, that's correct. Exactly that. Uh, nice. A book that I wrote um, more than a year ago. Well, not a long time ago because it's roughly one year and a half ago. Um, we didn't intend to spread the knowledge about Tanya Mel. Um, it's, uh, it was absolutely a great um, opportunity for me to, uh, to write a book. It's also the first uh, for me. So and I haven't written any books before, uh, but also because it's my passion. Uh, because my last year at uni, uh, uh, I spent most of the, um, most of the, uh, the year investing time in deploying machine learning at the very edge. But it wasn't like it is right now. It was very difficult. You had to use assembly. Uh, you didn't have many machine learning frameworks. Nowadays, it's very easy, user-friendly. People also with no technical background can deploy machine learning at the edge. And the intent of the book is actually to demonstrate this. So do you have any questions? So, I've actually we, got a copy. Yeah. This is my copy of the book right here. Let's see if we can get it without the glare. I want to. I want to get a little better, better view here. Oops, did I put up the wrong one? All right, let's see, Mike. There you go. Boom. Show us the book. All right, there we go. Tiny ML cookbook. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. So, so I've actually so, got a, a nice, uh, a nice signature and a message here from Jean Marco himself, which is really nice to have. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it's a like it's a very in depth book. Uh, you know, I, I said I started reading it on the plane, and you start out talking about like the difference between power and energy. You know, voltage, amperage, resistance, what it all means, how it all works. So, like, you start out at the lowest level on this book. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, real, yeah. Real quick, sorry. I just want to make sure here because, I, you know, uh, let me pull us, pull us back to the screen. I want to talk all about this book. I want that to be kind of the main theme here. But first of all, we keep throwing this tiny ML phrase out there so so before we kind of dive deep into this book and and all the cool stuff that it has in it if someone's watching this and has no idea what tiny ml is you can think about you know the little acronym machine learning ml great tiny ml i mean is this like the opposite of big ml what is big ml did it come from big ml i mean like is all other ml big ml maybe you could just kind of like first give us that bird's eye view of what is tiny ml before we absolutely. go into the book absolutely is machine learning first of all, but with tiny and tiny here refers to the power budget that we have. So it's tiny because the power budget usually for these kind of applications is in the order of milliwatts. So nothing, honestly, but there is a kind of device that is very suitable for, uh, for this type of machine learning, uh, microcontrollers, IoT devices, billions of devices around the world can be powered by machine learning. Um, and that is the reason there is the, the, there is a, the name for this kind of machine learning on this device, tiny ML. If you ask me why don't we call it just ML? Well, because here is a machine learning that may, need to meet the hardware. So it's something that you, you cannot build machine learning uh, algorithms without knowing the hardware because it's not something like, well, I have my big model and it's gonna be super slow. Not at all. If you have a very big model and you don't know your target device, you won't be able to run this model at all because the, the memory that you have on board in order to be so tiny in terms of power budget, it's very, very small. We are talking about one, two megabytes of program memory, which is, I would say, the, the hard drive and hundreds of kilobytes of RAM. So definitely nothing. That is the reason we call it tiny ML because this is the, the, the field where machine learning and the embedded hardware needs to meet together to allow smartness in a very non-intrusive way. You know, I think Michael have ha, Mike, you have you have an example of what these tiny objects look like, right? These yeah, tiny yeah. So, boards. Yeah, um, yeah. When, when I was going through the book, like it's not just theory, like it's not just talking about high level, like this is how machine learning or can work on devices, you've actually picked out some specific devices and you have projects that you walk people through on those devices. Uh, and the two uh, the two that you have that I've got um, is first the, uh, the Raspberry Pi Pico here, uh, which is their new little uh, microcontroller from Raspberry Pi that's got the RP2040 chip from ARM, which is, if I remember correctly, that is a uh, Cortex M0 Plus processor on it. 
So that's one of the boards that you use. And then the other one is from Arduino, and that is the Arduino Nano BLE Sense. So those are the two boards. And look, like you talk about, you know, resource usage. They're so small, these two things. Being able to load up a, a machine learning model and everything on them and uh, having the processing power to, to do something with that is pretty incredible uh, on something so small. Yeah, and well, probably I also have something. Ooh. This is something you're going to build with a book. Uh, not exactly with this version that you have shown, but with the next edition that uh, I'm preparing. But this tiny board is capable to recognize music, music genres. You have your music playing on, and it's capable of, the, of recognizing the music genre. If you ask me, why do we want to recognize music genre? Well, if you like music, you know that you want to adjust to equalize your sound depending on the, the music genre you're listening. And that is the kind of uh, application, for instance, for Tanya that listens the, 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 the song and adjusts the audio uh, for making, uh, making better for, for, our, for our ears. Nice. Okay. Nice. So, uh, Michael, I think let's, let's just start diving into these questions. Cause I think we have a lot of questions about tiny ML, about the book itself, about this, this next yeah, revision. Uh, I want to, I want to, um, go back in time a little bit though, and ask you how you first got started with machine learning. Like, what was it like then? What were you working on? And, uh, how did, how did that get you to where you are now? Oh, that's a difficult question. I don't remember. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, I remember. And everything started at uni, uh, more than 10 years ago. But the machine learning I was studying is not exactly the machine learning that we are referring to today. Uh, it was certainly uh, much different in terms of capabilities, in terms of accuracy at the same time. It's very, it was very basic, but it gave me for sure the, the fundamentals to, to understand uh, and contribute to the machine learning that we're seeing right now uh, on, on edge devices. And the machine learning particular I'm referring to is deep learning, uh, um, 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 let's say another, a type of machine learning algorithms that is dominant uh, on mobile for uh, image classification or, or for applying filters to uh, in our uh, favorite uh, social, uh, social app, for instance, uh, is absolutely at the heart of many apps, uh, Android apps, the, uh, nowadays. But I started at uni for sure. So the, the fundamentals were there. Thanks. Okay. Well, then it's my turn, right, Mike? Uh, actually, if you wouldn't mind me uh, asking my next oh, question. Go, yeah, no, yeah. Ask, 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 ask away, ask yeah. away. Yeah. So, um, like, what, what made you decide to write a book? Like, that's a big job to take on writing a book. Uh, and there was already stuff about uh, machine learning out there on the internet and everything. So what what was the need that you saw um, that your book fills? I, I want to add to this also real quick, Gene Marco. So so like I'm in the process of kind of over the last few years, it's not a technical book. It's just a book in general. So maybe if you could also kind of trickle in the process of like, you know, the creative juices that you may have, the desire to write a book, but could you maybe also talk about kind of like the business aspect, kind of like the process of getting a publisher involved and actually going through that part as well, or the business aspect? I'd like to hear that too. Absolutely. I, absolutely. Um, I think the main reason is because I wanted more uh, to sleep less. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it was because <clears throat> um, I'm very passionate about this field. And as I said, I, I started with TinyML, although at the time we TinyML it wasn't a, a word. We we're just talking about machine learning or microcontrollers. But as I said, it was very, very difficult. Um, and having worked in this field for many years and with a passion of sharing knowledge with the with developers and the community in general, I decided to write to write this book. Um, a book which is about demonstrating how easy now is machine learning on these uh, on these devices compared definitely to 10 years ago because as I said 10 years ago it was very very difficult in order to have very efficient implement uh, algorithms running on these devices well you need to be a, an expert on embedded programming you need to know, mm -hmm. to know assembly <clears throat> but nowadays because of the 
because Arduino, Raspberry Pis, Python, Engine Pulse, Google, and many, many other partners are making the life of developers extremely easy. And at the same time, a very, very efficient in terms of performance and easy to port among different platforms because of ARM. Because even if you target different platforms, since you have the same CPU, in this case, it's the NAM Cortex M microcontroller, migrate an application to another microcontroller, it's straightforward. Same application, I can guarantee it works seamless on, on other platforms. So the, the main reason for writing this book is the passion for sharing knowledge about this technology that, in my opinion, is going to uh, influence in a sustainable way how this, the smartness is going to be um, uh, spread among us in a very less intrusive way. And when I say less intrusive way, it means that it does not require internet connection. It's going to be around us, acts in, it, it, in, it, in all environment, but without sharing uh, data uh, with the cloud necessarily. What I... Um, uh, what I usually say is basically another level on top of the sensor. So with this much learning, usually we have, I mean, in the past, we, we used to have just the sensors. We, we get the data. Now much learning is just another layer on top of the sensor and they give the meaning to this data. Um, you know, I, I so I, I have not had the chance to read your book yet. I don't have one. Uh, Michael went and got one from you while we were out in Cambridge. I didn't want to take one from our ambassadors. Uh, you know, I think we got a certain amount for our ambassadors, but um, I might try to get one myself. The the uh, the I you know I think of companies like Edge Impulse, right? Where where you kind of I, I from what I understand, they also utilize this tiny ML layer. You can feed in a bunch of images or feed in a bunch of data, and then have it kind of crunch that data for you and create this model. Um, it, could you kind of touch on how your book maybe addresses some of these services that are out there? Does it address any services that are out there currently? And, and you know, what might a developer do to prepare themselves uh, to dive into your book? That's, um, so I like this question, first of all, <clears throat> because it helps me to understand also, uh, to, to explain why, I choose these uh, th these frameworks uh, and these software tools. So uh, yes, the book uh, uses Edge Impulse as a, a machine learning framework. Ah, okay, um, so it's in there. Yeah, it's, nice. it's in there. It's in there because uh, that is absolutely the, the easiest way to uh, to deploy machine learning on these devices. But at the same time, um, in the book, there are recipes for using directly Google uh, TensorFlow, for instance, or TensorFlow Lite in the context of deployment uh, for on-edge devices. Um, and using Edge Impulse and, and Google helps um, help the reader to, um, to have a high level overview of how the things uh, uh, work, but at the same time, understand if they are interested, the low level aspects, they are behind the scene on Edge Impulse, for instance. Um, this is in particular true for the second edition, where uh, I try to have a similar recipe with Edge Impulse and Google TensorFlow in order to, um, to expose the, to the reader all the techni te technicalities that are behind Edge Impulse. But absolutely, the, the service is, is very easy. It's very easy to use because, uh, first of all, the, uh, there is a UI. You don't have to program anything. Uh, it's just move... Uh, box around it to, the, to design the network um, also acquiring data quite straightforward uh, in one of the recipe um, I explained for instance how to, to use the smartphone or um, or directly the Arduino from the web browser uh, to collect data um, and absolutely this is the uh, the uh, a, a great tool to make the, the life easier to, to developers. Nice. Well, yeah. Thank you very much for that. I, you know, I think uh, I think that um, you know, in 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 most part, right? Like you think, <clears throat> uh, right now, looking at resources, you go to you know places like Coursera or Udemy or YouTube, and you get these resources. You go online, you get you get things like Hackster.io or the New Developer Hub or Learning Paths, and the idea of like picking up a book. I remember, right? Like so, for me, when I was in university, books were everything. 
Like you got oh, yeah. that book, you needed that book to finish that course. And the book was just this wealth of knowledge and anything that you needed to answer for that test or for that particular project, it was in that book. And so when I graduated school, my first approach was to start reading some of these early, like the Arduino, uh, I think it was called the Arduino project handbook. Uh, I think I got like a raspberry Pi project handbook. And so this seems to be kind of like that tiny ML cookbook, right? So you want to get it, you hope. Yes. And so, I mean, um, very, very exciting stuff. And I, you know, I, I, it, it makes me want to go back and grab, a, grab s- some books again and start getting back into this, into this uh, whole learning process when it comes to some, some new things that, that, that I'm interested in. Yeah. So and this is the very... first like tech book I've owned in a while because mostly I get everything online, but I remember like when I was learning, um, like the, that, that Pearl cookbook was one of the first tech books I ever bought. Like that O'Reilly, the classic camel one. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the approach using the book is exactly, uh, I mean, it's, it's this, or at least the intent is this, is to give a practical experience to learn also the principles, because the, the recipes are not disconnected from the principle. It's not just, okay, do this, do this, do this, but rather do this because, and you follow the, the instructions, but explain the, the principles in order to give developers the opportunity to 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 do a similar recipe for their own uh, reasons, for their own, sc- uh, own scopes, for instance. You, so, you make it very accessible too, because you didn't choose like a, a three, four, five hundred dollar development board for these projects. The the Picos, I think, like fifteen dollars. Uh, the the BLE Sense is, I want to say, like forty five dollars when I bought it. So like, they're they're very affordable boards to to be able to do machine learning on the edge with. Yes, and 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 probably. I can attach the the meaning of tiny to what you have just said, because making so tiny, it also means making more affordable at the same time, because this is a technology that can uh, drive innovation with not a lot of money, because these devices are very cheap uh, and are are great. You don't have to spend a fortune to have a a sophisticated uh, application powered by machine learning. Yeah, when we, when we were in Cambridge, we went to that Raspberry Pi store there in the mall, and they had these these Picos there for I want to say it was like three pounds fifty or something like that, like less than a cost of a coffee. You can get a development board that you can do machine learning on. Yeah, legit, less than a cup of coffee, and you could use that board to like you know brew coffee if you you could make a coffee machine. You could, yeah, that. make yourself a smart coffee maker. Okay, so so Gianmarco, now now that we're kind of on the topic of this book, I think it's funny because me and Mike came up with kind of two opposite type questions. Um, I am interested in knowing which chapter or part of this book was the most difficult for you to write and or work on and why. And I'm looking at Mike's question and sorry, Mike, I'm just going to say this because we can kind of like the opposites is Mike wants to know what your favorite part of the book. And it might be the same thing. It might've been, we came up with these separately, but it might be like maybe the hardest one you to work on was your favorite, but uh, you know, he wants to know your favorite part your favorite build, you know, or whatever it was that you want to show off the most. And then for me, it's what was the most difficult thing that you worked on in this book? I'm afraid it is the same chapter. Ah, that's good. <laughs> so it's the same chapter because um, it is probably the most challenging to write, the most enjoyable to write at the same time. Um, but it was difficult because it touched an area where um um you need a bit of background on soft optimizations when you talk about soft optimizations you think about well we need uh, the super experts that know exactly that architecture for improving the performance of that algorithm that is not actually true sometimes you just need the software libraries to make i mean the developer life a lot easier and the chapter we're referring to in the book is um, the chapter that um, wants to build a, a scene uh, recognition application. So an application that can recognize indoor environments. Um, is an application where, for instance, can be deployed on a, a, a home robot that can recognize the rooms and schedule, for instance, the cleaning of the room uh, on certain times, for instance. And it's, it's quite useful. Um, But it was quite challenging because when we talk about machine learning, every time we say, well, this is just a problem about ML. But 
if you if you think about it, here we have a camera, and from the camera to the machine learning, there are certain operations that you need to perform that are not trivial. And it was a challenge task because I had to explain in easy words how to do it. Uh, and I think that was the chapter where I spent most of the time, but I also enjoyed a lot because this is my background. I work in software or performance organizations and it gave me also the opportunity to talk about some uh, simple techniques that can be extremely beneficial on these devices. Soft optimizations is not something that you need to, um, uh, you need also to keep in mind, in particular on these devices, not just to achieve the best performance, what well, is absolutely important, but also because you don't have a lot of RAM available, you have hundreds of kilobytes. So if you're not able to optimize the pipeline properly, you're not able to run it at all. So explain the workflow, explain the optimizations in, in easy terms. The reader, that was absolutely very challenging. But at the same time, I really enjoy it because I hope that could give developers the opportunity to think about it and deploy similar uh, algorithms for other, um, for other scenarios. So I'm you glad have... you brought up the optimizations because a lot of devices now, like the, the latest smartphones have like uh, tensor processors as uh, part of the, the system on a chip. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure the new uh, M1 and M2 Max have a, a Tensor coprocessor as well. And then, of course, ARM's got the whole ethos line of uh, NPUs for optimizing machine learning. Does your book touch on how to use any of those? The answer is yes. <laughs> yes, uh, it is the last chapter of the first edition of Tanimal Cookbook. Um, it was the last chapter because that is the what next? What next in the tiny ML space of machine learning or microcontrollers in particular? And in that chapter, I touched the micro MPUs or the micro neural processing unit. That is a, a processor that makes um, machine learning workloads very efficient, these devices. Uh, in, and in order to explain how this technology works, uh, I use not tens uh, Google TensorFlow, uh, but I use a TVM, a TVM Apache. So another framework uh, which allows to uh, to build machine learning um, models ahead of time. Don't want to go into the technical details, but that is the, the framework that I use to uh, to demonstrate how to leverage the neural processing uh, capabilities available on on certain ARM um, Cortex uh, M based microcontrollers. All right, so if anybody wants the details, go get yourself a copy of the Tiny ML Cookbook. Yeah, I'm going to put it up here. Yeah. About that. Gianmarco, do you mind if we share your, your LinkedIn? Is that, that, that okay to put Absolutely. up here? Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so um, anyone else who, you know, this, this, this show only goes on for so long, um, if you want to go follow uh, Gianmarco on LinkedIn, I would suggest uh, heading on over there and I'm, I'm putting up his, uh, his banner right now so you can see it, but I've also posted it in the comments on YouTube. You can uh, head on over to John Marco's LinkedIn, check it out, follow him. And of course I'd, I'd imagine that they can reach out to you if they have some sort of access to, to message you or something. <clears throat> um, now I want to kind of, I, I want to kind of touch on community, right? Because developer communities are a big thing. Pull this down here. Developer communities are a big thing. And, um, you know, you, you kind of like start scoping around, you see all the big companies are starting to build out these developer communities. And I'm wondering, have you kind of like latched on to or started your own community around your book? Or are you kind of like, putting your, your, your efforts and your support efforts into, cause I, I can't imagine people don't have questions throughout this. <clears throat> they run into a chapter they need help with. They maybe, you know, want to talk to another developer who's using this book as well. Do you have a community platform you're using right now, anywhere where you go and you offer support to these people who are these developers who are, who are using your book? Okay. Um, interesting question. So, um, I've wrote, I've wrote the book to support, let's say, the, the TinyML Foundation, because there is already a community for TinyML, and that is the yeah. TinyML Foundation. Okay. So that is absolutely the place where the, the discussion um, goes on, where we can share the, the, the knowledge and also the, the, um, the challenges, because this is a, a, a field that is continuously evolving, improving. Uh, it's not very static, I would say. 
but at the same time, well, the recipe, all the recipes, all the projects are hosted on GitHub. So if there are questions related to the specific projects, so certainly GitHub is the best place. Oh yeah. But for going beyond the, the projects presented in the book, the places, the Tiny Map Foundation, particularly in the forum, that is very, very active um, where <clears throat> people share the, uh, the um, challenges they're facing right now for deploying machine learning uh, at the very edge or missing operators because uh, sometimes we develop a model for running in the cloud as you can imagine, running the cloud is not the same as running at the very edge because the capabilities are very, very different. And people, maybe they ask advices to, okay, how can I make it smaller, this model, to run it efficiently on my controllers? So that is uh, the kind of questions that uh, you can find in, Tiny ML for, uh, in the TinyML forum, yes. And you, you are in the ARM Discord, though, right? You're in the, the ARM developer Discord? <clears throat> I'm also there, absolutely. So if someone did come by with a question about the book, you might be able to help them out. Absolutely, I okay. can also question that. I can also answer the question there. Awesome, awesome. Great. Yeah, and and by the way, if you do, sorry, Michael, real quick here. If you have, did, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to plug the AI ML channel in our Discord. So oh, uh, if you, you join go. that, you you can come talk about uh, Tiny ML in that channel. Yeah, and I mean, I was just scoping out the Tiny ML website. You know, I've noticed several other little communities pop up around Tiny ML. So, you know, not only that, you have companies like Edge Impulse, right, where they have their communities that they're building. And so, like, you know, you run into that chapter where you're working with Edge Impulse. You know, I'm pretty sure that their community would be happy to help you out there as well. So, um, I'm always just I'm a big community guy. So I'm I'm always looking for for you know where where the developers congregate around these types of cool things that are happening. So, so I yeah. thought that was interesting. And yeah. I, I'm sure, and and honestly, going back to the original question, I I'm not like the kind of person that want to own my community. I don't I don't like it. I want nah. to contribute to existing communities. <clears throat> and in the on Discord, actually, sorry, <clears throat> I can. Um, um, I have been active recently for supporting people for deploying machine learning on ARM, on ARM Cortex semi-controllers, and not just that, but also on uh, Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is not very, is not on the tiny, so the board that you have shown before, that is the Raspberry Pi Pico, that is absolutely good for tiny ML. But the Raspberry Pi, recently the latest, the Raspberry Pi 5, yeah, is not for tiny ML because the Pi budget is uh, very different. And we have also different libraries for that field. Awesome, okay. So Mike, I see you still have a few more questions here. Did you wanna not? I do, yeah, so so your your book, Tiny ML Cookbook, was published in spring of last year, but you have a second edition out now. So uh, what made you decide to, to make a second edition uh, so soon? Well, I wanted more sleepless night. <laughs> so it wasn't, <laughs> so I wanted to sleep and, so um, <clears throat> the reason is because this field is evolving so quickly that I wanted to give uh, the community uh, more updated content. And that was, um, last year I, I attended the Tiny ML EMEA uh, event in Cyprus. And during the, that event, I realized that there were some new topics okay. that were very relevant uh, for a second edition. And that is the reason I said, well, let's create a second edition rather than just making, uh, just fixing the issues of the first edition. Let's fix the issue of the second the first edition. Plus, let's add some additional chapters to, to this story. Um, uh, and so that is the, the main reason. So you hey. mentioned that this space is evolving so fast. Are there any boards out now? that uh, you think uh, like like you would want to have as uh, as project boards for tiny ml that you didn't necessarily have when you wrote the first edition okay so there is one board and one additional board for in the second edition of the book which is the uh, spark fun artemis nano so it's a new friend uh for the tiny ml community um so there will be the arduino nano 33 ble the raspberry pi pico and this new board, which wasn't available during the first edition. Uh, so absolutely, there are new boards, the endless boards, I would say, that you can use for Tiny ML. And the reason I, I decided to, to pick these boards is because are different from three different companies. Uh, but at the same time, moving the code from one, from one platform to another 
it costs zero time. And that is the most important thing for developers because probably they need to, uh, to deploy application on different devices. But if, you, if I need to migrate my application to another device and I need to rewrite the software from scratch, well, that, I mean, so productivity fun. goes down very quickly, right? Yeah. And by here, by using three different platforms from three different vendors, actually, I can demonstrate how easy is porting the code among different platforms. Uh, and that is definitely enjoyable. I, I really enjoy to write the code that works everywhere and I don't need to tweak it for running on different devices. Yeah, in a lot of cases, you know, it, when when looking at kind of the, the the path to product, right? You you end up you, you may end up building something on on a on one board using a particular chipset that has these capabilities with you know memory storage, whatever you want to call it, but then realize that maybe you need more of something, and so you know migrating to a board that has a different call it maybe even supply chain, uh, you, you know, the the accessibility to the, that that hardware may be different and in your path to product you know knowing that that you can start development here and find some sort of blocker but be able to pivot to a different you know piece of hardware <clears throat> again this may not be the exact case but i know that you know this is something that's uh, very well observed when you're when you're building something you people go out of business when when they can't migrate something properly like you know you start on something and that could literally be the 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 nail in the coffin when it comes to a company building some sort of hardware that they when they can't yeah. migrate something properly, the developer costs go too high or development costs are too high. Next thing you know, they're gone. So it's a it's definitely something that people need to be looking at. Yeah, and uh, honestly, <clears throat> I'm still a developer, and I want something very easy <clears throat> when I when I deploy this kind of application. So what very easy? I mean that regardless of the uh, for instance the ARM CPUs because the CPUs on these devices is different. It's still an ARM Cortex M micro uh, base CPU, but you have an ARM Cortex M0, M4, M4 plus DSP acceleration. But the code is actually the same because the magic is in the library. And if you use a library that can dispatch the optimized routines depending on the on the Tiger CPU, well, that is super easy for developers. They don't need to use different libraries for different architectures. So, that is what I mean by ease of use. I don't want to change anything in my source code. I want just to run it in the most efficient way. Nice. Okay. And so um, what is it? We have this question about uh, you, you, you had the second edition, but now there may be some more stuff coming up in the near future. Is this, is this something you could talk about now or you want to save it as a teaser? No, no, absolutely. I can talk about the, the new additions to the second edition. Uh, there are um, four additional uh, things to the to the second edition. Um, one is about the um, the object detection uh, an object detection application using FOMO algorithm from Edge Impulse that uh, will be deployed on the Raspberry Pi Pico and the Spark from Artemis Nano. The second thing, and that is probably my favorite chapter, uh, because it brings me back to uni is the music genre, genre recognition. That was something that I wanted to have 10 years ago, but machine learning wasn't that sophisticated. So I had to abandon that yet. So in, in this second edition, I decided to, to use the latest technology to de to develop a music genre recognition and show that actually now is doable and, and very, very fast at the same time. Uh, it was it was uh, I very enjoyed writing that in that chapter. The new thing is about uh, TVM on Arduino because in the first edition I mentioned T I used TVM for deploying on ETHOS U a micro MPU, which is the ARM uh, micro MPU for uh, microcontrollers. So in the second edition there is there will be TVM with uh, the micro MPU, but also TVM with Arduino and Raspberry Pi Pico, and it's part for Artemis Nano. Plus, the last chapter will be about, and also uh, I can confirm that I managed to make it running uh, yesterday night, <laughs> so it works, is on-device learning on microcontrollers. That is absolutely a very cool area where you don't run the machine learning just, I mean, you don't have machine learning just for inference, but you have a machine learning that can learn 
to adapt and basically adds personalization this is something that uh, i find it very uh, very interesting but is the last chapter because this field is still in very wild at the, at, at the moment uh, there are many 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 ways you can do it but at the same time it's challenging because it requires also a lot of memory and, and floating point acceleration but despite these challenges uh, there are you can run it and that last chapter will demonstrate how to deploy back propagation algorithm on these microcontrollers very, very interesting. Do you have a do you have a date when these are going to be coming out, or or is that going to be a surprise? By the way, you heard it here first, everyone. <laughs> Innovation Coffee exclusive. Yes. So um, uh, it's going to be in November. Uh, oh, wow. If I'm able to com to to complete this last chapter on time. <laughs> so as I said, it's well, probably I didn't say that, but um, it's not easy to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. It's not easy at all. Uh, because you need to squeeze the time during the night, but at the same time, you need to sleep because you need to go to work the day after. So uh, you need to find time. Uh, and find time is sometimes is very challenging. Wait, ARM doesn't give you like a few hours a week to dedicate to this? Sorry? Arm ARM doesn't give you a few hours a week to dedicate to this? Uh, Oh, you should talk to you should talk to your boss. <laughs> I'll do well, it. That's how yeah. he, he keeps copyright of it. If uh, if Arm was paying him to write. Oh, it. that's true. That's true. If Arm, yeah, Arm would want Arm would want the the book for them, huh? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe. So um, it's it's very very difficult. Um, you also had a question about how is the the process of writing. Yeah, the business side of things, because you know, I'm I'm interested, right? Like, real quick, just to kind of give you my my reason behind this. Like, <clears throat> I've been writing this book. It's I call it Building Blocks, and it's essentially take I take I take you know roughly two dozen people in my life from as long as I can remember, and I identify a single moment in time that this one person did something that had such a massive influence on the direction of my life. And I tell that story, but in a perspective that allows kind of other people to relate to this. And these are like what I call circumstances, uh, um, uh, um, circumstances of change or circumstances that direct your life in that way. It's like you could go to like these socio, it's not technical at all, but like, you know, you could always say like, oh, why are you in such a bad condition? Why are you homeless? Why are you this way? And it's like, they may not have had that one person do that one thing at that exact moment in time allowed them to make that decision, that right decision. And so that's the idea. Now I've been writing these chapters out, but like, at, what, let's just say I finish writing these chapters. Like, what do I do? Like, do I, do I get an editor? Do I go to a publisher? Like how, what's next? Like that. So that's kind of where I'm at. Like once I finish this, what do I do? Okay. I mean, you, you can certainly publish it. You can uh, probably be your own editor for your book. I mean, you can. You don't need probably a publisher uh, at all. It depends on what. For me, the publisher is was a must and was a need because um, without a publisher, it was very challenging to to continue writing. Um, I give you this example, but I wanted to write a book long time ago, but without a publisher. And so, what it happens? Well, you start writing the first chapter. And you pause and this pause goes for months and you never finish the book oh i see okay. <laughs> so they're, they're busting it they're busting down your door yeah, yeah gotcha. with the publisher instead you have to finish you have to mm, and not say, I'm, I'm not, i don't want to say you have strict deadlines but you have some deadlines that you need to uh, to respect right so um and that is the reason so it makes me writing continuously yeah because no, like, yeah, that is the only reason. <laughs> gotcha. For you, for you. I, 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 yeah, that, that's nice. Okay. I like that. I like that's a good reason. Okay, cool. Well, thank but, you. Sir, yeah. But, no, go ahead. No, sorry. I, is there anything else you wanted to add to that? Sorry. No, what I wanted to say is um, I, um, before I said it's very, uh, it's very challenging writing a book. What can definitely helps is to have the structure in mind because well, if you don't have a structure in terms of the, the story you want to tell, at least at high level, it's definitely very difficult. But sometimes, even if you have this structure and you have the outline very well prepared, well, impediments and blockers are on the way anyway, because something yeah. doesn't work as expected. 
and this brings delay. So these are this means that there are anyway challenges, even if you try to plan everything in advance. But this is the nature of of everything we try to plan in advance. Yeah. Well, thank you for answering that. I appreciate that. I, I know Mike has one more thing to go into. We're getting close to the top of the hour. So, so you know, let's get Mike's question. We yeah, have a well, shameless this, plug. I, this, and... this is a very forward-thinking question. So, like, right now, the hottest thing in AI and ML is generative AIs. And, ah. like, I know those take this, the large language models. There's a lot of data that goes into them. But I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, generative AI in general and when and how you think that can come down to tiny devices. Oh, how many hours do I have? Uh, you've you got, have, you have about minutes. five minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes <laughs> the most. Okay. Break it down. So, so generative AI is absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, it promised to, to bring intelligence in, in very uh, new ways, I would say. I start from your last question is about the tiny ML aspect. When are we going to see these generative AI, uh, generative AI use cases for time out. I'm not sure we're gonna see in the shorter term. These models are, at the moment are so big that we also struggle on devices like smartphones nowadays because these models are gigabytes of, of uh, files with gigabytes of data. Mm -hmm. And we are talking about megabytes, well, two megabytes just so for the hard drive of tiny, uh, for these tiny devices. Um, the i think the most important thing is to understand the use cases why do we need generative ai in the tiny ml space for doing what um i think the first thing that we need to uh, to find is this is the use case for uh, for tiny ml about the uh, the generative ai use case in general i think these probably unlock new opportunities uh, also in the end uh, in the in the in mobile deployment uh, with new applications probably um, we are going to see new apps that are going to leverage this technology for um, I don't know gen generate uh, text or generate uh, images based on prompt um, but certainly for time ML it's very 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 challenging uh, or at least we are not ready yet to have something like that on these tiny devices there was a there's a there's a company and by the way great question mike because this makes me think i'm sorry i gotta ask another question now there, there's a there's a company that i advise for uh called iotechs and what they're doing is they're, they're building out all of their tutorials all of their documentation and they're putting it into this kind of let's call it a generative ai ml model and they're inputting it all and then instead of like having this very let's call it somewhat static faq you can actually ask this model questions and then it searches through this this you know database of this just all this data and then it comes up with an answer so technically could someone take your book put it into this you know ml model and then build this ml model and then ask questions like while i'm going through this book i could be like ask a question and then it could come up with the answer to that question or has the potential to come up with the answer to that question it, th that that seems pretty fascinating to me it is. Well, it is also for me. So, um, I mean, go. I think one of the most uh, challenging aspects for reading the book is I want to do something particular. How do I find this something particular in uh, 500 pages? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. certainly, probably generative AI can can answer this question more quickly, also than me, than I than I wrote the book. Yeah. <laughs> Probably we have opened a new, a new use case actually for you know, for generative AI. But yes, what I hope to see in the near future is this type of application, not just in the cloud, but also mobile, um, because that is absolutely the uh, probably the the area that we want to see general AI growing. Um, That's just crazy to think about. Like you know, and I know ChatGPT is trying to get there, but like you know, you you essentially the ability to ask any question what is this uh, hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy meaning of life right like yeah. the ability to ask a computer any question you can think of and it literally takes all of the content that all humanity has ever created and then <laughs> finds the answer to that question and that's basically what we're headed towards i mean it's no, so it's, it's insane since you bring that up what would be really cool is if like the the ebook version of this came with 
a, a data model that got loaded into your Kindle. So you could ask your Kindle questions and it could just have access to that right there. Let's yeah. ask the publisher. Yeah, the publisher. <laughs> the publisher is just going to come to you with a whip. He's going to be like, yeah, Marco, indeed. we need, we, we need <laughs> you to build this. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, you know, I think that, I, I think that you, this was just great, Jim Marco. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been My awesome. Uh, Michael, did yeah. you have any last things you wanted to ask before we go into the last couple segments here before we close? No, I've had all my questions answered, uh, but when I have more, I know where to find you. I will uh, give you a ping on our discord. Awesome. Okay. I give you a virtual hug guys. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's super pleasure, honestly, to be here. This is always so much fun for us as well. So thank you. Um, the last thing we allow our guests to do here, Jen Marco, is to give a shameless plug. And I know we've talked about your book this entire time. I'm going to plug it for you as well. Make sure everyone goes and checks out the Tiny ML Cookbook by Jen Marco Iodice. It's on Amazon. We made a nice little um, you know, short URL there for you, 7 capital A, lowercase dq. Um, go check that out. We'll share it in the description. It'll be in the description of the video for you watching on demand. Check that out. Um, but aside from that, is there anything else you'd like to send people to? Or do you just want to mimic my uh, mimic my, my my shameless plug here for your book? I mimic yours. No, you what mimic I want to say, try to innovate and try to think tiny because there are endless real opportunities, including with algae. So there was a project I worked last uh, in a few months back with University of Cambridge, and we managed to run a machine learning algorithm on an ARM Cortex M zero microcontroller with algae. And I oh. think I want to leave you with this. So we need to think just tiny to make something very, very cool and at the same time useful. Think tiny, think tiny to make something big. Yeah. All there right. you go. Yeah. All right. So yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I, Michael, can I close this out? You good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, I'm going to close this out. Well, uh, once again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I say this all the time, but you could have spent this hour doing so many other things, and yet you spent it here with us. We appreciate you and every minute you spent here with us. Jen Marco, our featured guest today, thank you very much for being here. And we look forward to seeing you all next week, 5 p.m. UTC on Thursday. We will be here once again with another featured guest, bringing you all sorts of cool arm developments here on innovation coffee now if you enjoyed this live stream we once again will ask you to hit that like button it helps us out a lot and don't forget to subscribe to the arm software developer channel one last reminder for everyone again whether you're watching this right now live or on demand make sure you go check out the tiny ml cookbook by Gianmarco Yudise here rewind if you didn't watch this whole thing Gianmarco gave a lot of insights on this i think we asked some decent questions and uh and there's some uh good stuff there for y'all to check out so uh once again jen marco thank you so much i hope you have a wonderful day michael the wonderful you too. wonderful co-hosts here i think we killed it y'all nice uh, again yeah see you all next time take care have a great great day bye thank everyone you. bye Thanks, guys.